We're now going to look at how good these approximations are in two examples of the update step in the extended comma filter. In this first example, we assume that we have a predicted density of a scalar xk with mean 8 and standard deviation 3.5. We then get a scalar observation yk, which is equal to 6, which is related to our state according to this nonlinear function, where we have h of xk plus some noise rk, where the noise is an additive and with zero mean and standard deviation 2, and the nonlinear function h of xk is this quadratic function of our state. Now, what we want to do here is to both find the true posterior mean and the approximate posterior mean that is given by the EKF, so x hat k given k. So, how should we do this? So, if we look at this figure to the right, here we have the original nonlinear model in blue and the linearized model around the predicted mean in red, where the predicted mean is 8, which is here. Now, we have some initial uncertainty regarding x, as described by our predicted density. Now, we could illustrate our predicted density on the x-axis. So, we have a Gaussian predicted density with the mean 8 and standard deviation of 3.5, which could look something like this. Now, in the EKF, the posterior density is approximated using this linear model here, instead of this nonlinear model. In order to get the posterior from this, we can use that the posterior is proportional to the joint. So, using the product rule. To look at this, we can first illustrate our joint density of x and y, and then use this proportionality to get the posterior when we have fixed y equal to 6 as our measurement. So, if we start by illustrating the one sigma contour of our joint. Now, I find that the joint is easiest to roughly illustrate by using this expression here, and then for a fixed x, looking at the uncertainty in y using this measurement model. So, let's say we fixate x at our mean here. So at this point, our uncertainty in y direction is given by our measurement models. We have the mean here, and then we have an uncertainty in y given by our measurement noise rk, which is zero mean and with standard deviation the square root of 2. So if we want to illustrate the plus minus 1 sigma contour of our joint, in this point we should have something that goes here and here, which is roughly plus minus the square root of 2. Now, if we do this for all values of x, get this weighted by probability of x, we can perhaps imagine that the one sigma contour ellipse of our joint distribution would look something like this. To get the approximated posterior, we can now use that p of x given y, our posterior, is proportional to this joint. And if we fix yk equal to 6, which is our observation in this case, so yk is here, so we can view our posterior by viewing our joint as a function of xk, where we fix yk equal to 6. And that's the same as viewing our joint as this slice, where yk is fixed to 6. So if we try to illustrate this slice, it could look something like this. Now note that this density now is coming out of the figure. And if we look at the mean of this, our estimate is now the mean of this density, which is somewhere here. If we project this down to our x-axis, we see our mean that the EKF would give us is roughly 10.8, or thereabout. With a similar procedure, we can get the true joint to something like this, where we now follow the nonlinear measurement model instead of our linearized one. And again, if we look at this joint as a function of xk, when we fixed yk equal to 6, we get a posterior that is proportional to something like this. And the posterior mean is the mean of this density, so the posterior mean would be something like 10.4. So, in this case, we have something mildly nonlinear, so our linearized model is fairly accurate. And as a result, there's not a super big difference between the EKF estimate and the true posterior mean. So in this case, the EKF performs fairly well. So let's look at another example. Here we have a more nonlinear measurement model where h of xk is equal to 0.01 times xk cube. 
which is illustrated by this blue curve to the right. And the dashed red line is our linear approximation of this model if we linearize in the predicted mean, which is 3. So, here. The question is again to find a true posterior mean and approximate posterior mean given by the EKF. And in this case, our observation is yk equal to 2. So, if we approach this in the same manner as we did in the previous example, we start by illustrating the predicted density, which is a Gaussian density with mean 3 and a standard deviation of 3.5. And this could look something like this. Now, using this and our linearized measurement model, we can illustrate our joint density of xk and yk like this. Now, note that the variance of our measurement noise is 0.3 in this example, so we get something that is much tighter around our model compared to our previous example. So, if we get this observation yk equal to 2, we can find the posterior density of xk given this observation as proportional to this joint here, if we fix yk as 2. Now, this is the same thing as looking at this slice of the joint. So, the EKF would approximate the posterior mean as the mean of this density, which is somewhere around 9. Now, we would like to compare this to the true posterior mean, which we get in the same way, but by considering the true joint distribution instead of the Gaussian approximation that the EKF does by linearizing the measurement model. The true joint distribution can be illustrated the same way as we did in the previous example by considering the support of xk and by considering how much uncertainty we should add around h of xk, as expressed by this blue curve, given by the measurement noise covariance, so 0.3. In this case, the true joint could look something like this. And by looking at the slice of this, where yk is equal to 2, we get the true posterior proportional to this density. Now the true posterior is the mean of this, which should be around here, so it's around 6. So for this example, there is a significant difference between the true posterior mean and the EKF approximation. This is basically because there is a big difference between the true joint distribution and our Gaussian approximation. Compared to the previous example, we can see two reasons for this difference. The first is that our linear approximation is not accurate compared to our uncertainty in the predicted state. Now, we see that there is a fairly high chance that xk is around 6, but our approximation is only accurate between, say, 2 and 4 in this region here. The second reason is that our measurements are very accurate. That is, we have very little measurement noise, so only 0.3 in this case. This means that our joint density is very tightly aligned with our nonlinear function. So our nonlinearities are more pronounced. Whereas if we have more measurement noise, so the variance in RK would be large, this would hide our nonlinearities more in our joint distribution. So we we'll get something that is wider here, and more Gaussian. One way of thinking of this would be to let the measurement noise covariance go to infinity, in which case the influence of how accurately we can approximate this part of the model becomes less and less important, because this part of the model is drowned by all the measurement noise. We wrap up our presentation of EKF with some concluding remarks. To start with, the EKF is a recursive algorithm, so at each time instant it does the same thing, and that is to compute Gaussian approximations of the predicted density and the posterior density. The approximations that an EKF does is that it approximates the nonlinear models as linear, and then computes the resulting Gaussian densities using the normal Kalman filter equations. So in a sense, the EKF is also approximately LMMSE, in that it approximates a system as linear, and then computes the LMMSE estimate for that system. Now, this usually works quite well, as long as the system is not too nonlinear, as we saw in our first example. One practical difference between the EKF and the other nonlinear filters that we will study in this course is that in order to implement the EKF, you need to compute the derivatives of the nonlinear functions. Now, this could be tedious, but there are nowadays plenty of ways for a computer to do this for us. But there could be situations 
where our models do not actually have a well-defined derivative, in which case the EKF cannot be used. However, compared to the other nonlinear filters that we study, it has the lowest computational complexity. So, now we know everything about the EKF. 